you for your presence. Thank you for your presence. You're going to lend me your ears for just a few minutes. Lend me your ears for a few minutes. We're going to look at the story, at a story in the book of 1 Samuel. First Samuel chapter 4. quickly recently I've been speaking to the Lord about his power the power of the Lord has been intriguing me and as I was in my quiet time the Lord led me to this portion of scripture and he he placed it on my heart to read about the Ark of the Covenant, specifically this one instance where the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines and they thought to put it in the same place that they put their God and their God fell. So I went and looked in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 3, we see the Lord calling Samuel. And in verse 4, in chapter 4 rather, this is where the ark of God is captured. So the Israelites are fighting, but they're defeated by the Philistines. And all through verse 3, verse, verse 3 and 4, the Israelites begin to wonder why they were defeated. They were confused. If you go to verse 3 of 1 Samuel 4. The people came into the camp and the elders said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? So they came up with this idea and said, let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us. That when it comes among us, it may save us from the hands of the enemies. The Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament represented God's presence here on earth. The Holy Spirit had not come into men to dwell so that they are carriers of the, of the presence. So the Lord gave Moses an instruction and said, build me a place. Build me an, an ark. He gave him instructions and he says, that's where I will be. So all through the Old Testament, the presence of the Lord is portrayed as the ark of the covenant. It is a symbol of the ark. So the Israelites knowing this thought, we have the ark in our possession, but why has the Lord defeated us? We have the presence of the Lord with us, but why have we been defeated? So they come up with this idea and say, okay, let's bring the ark onto the battleground so that when it is here, it will save us, right? So they place their hope in this ark they place their trust in this ark at first when i read this i thought okay they're great people they know what they they know the power of god they must be people that know of their god but as i was reading i understood later as we continue in chapter 4 they're defeated yet again but this time the ark of the lord is on the ground but they're still defeated. And it got me to question, why? Why on earth would they still be defeated even though the ark of the Lord was on ground? So when they come up with this idea, they raise a shout. Verse 6 to 9 says, Now when the Philistines heard this shout, so the children of Israel bring the ark of the covenant onto the ground, and they raise a shout. The Bible says they raise a shout that shakes the earth. And 
the Philistines heard this. They heard this noise. They heard this shout and said, what does the sound mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come in the camp. So the enemies understood that the presence of the Lord was now on ground. Verse 7 says, So the Philistines were afraid. For they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. The presence of the Lord while on ground in the midst of battle caused fear in the enemy's camp and it got me questioning the people that brought the ark of the Lord onto the ground they simply shouted it doesn't say that they praised they just shouted they made a sound they made noise but they didn't revere the God that made the ark they simply put their trust in the ark they put their hope in the symbol and left behind the God of said symbol. But their enemies understood. They said, God has come, capital G. That means the Philistines knew, the enemy knew that this is the one true living God. And if the one true living God is on camp, we're done. So they, they get afraid. Meanwhile, in the Israelites' camp, they're just shouting. They're just making noise. And the noise is great that, you know, it makes the earthquake. And it's great. It's, it's a sound that is released in the atmosphere. But whether or not it's praise to the God who made the heavens and the earth, it's questionable. Because this, what happens after this is that they're defeated again. So even though the ark was on the ground God had come into the camp the Israelites were still defeated and the ark of the Lord was taken by the enemy I, th I found it really insane that the enemy knew that God was in the middle of things they merely heard of the God of Israel they heard rumors of how he destroyed the Egyptians, verse 8. They heard about how he defeated the Egyptians with all the plagues and then drowned them in the water. They heard of these things and feared. But the ones who saw these things merely shouted. They just shouted. The children of Israel at this point had stopped trusting in God, but trusted in the ark. They trusted in the ark, but not the God of the ark. They trusted in church, but not in God. They said, if I come to church, I'm okay. But they didn't trust in God. They became complacent with the God of heaven and earth. They became laxed with the God who created them, who brought them out of slavery, saw them through the wilderness. They became relaxed. That they thought the ark was simply a magic box of victory. That if we bring this box here, we have to win. They didn't understand the God of the ark. They didn't understand the presence of God. They merely knew the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. They merely understood the symbol and neglected the God who dwells among them. But you see, the enemy didn't see the Ark as just a box. The enemy knew that God had entered the situation. I put it to you that your enemy knows that God is strong. Your enemy knows that this God is the one true living God. And when you mention the name Jesus, he trembles. But somehow you as the individual that has mentioned the name have become laxed with the name. That it's now just another name. 
Do you see what happened when we call the name of Yahweh? Did you see the power that is in the name? You may not have seen physical miracles, but I know what happened in the spirit when we raised the name of Yahweh. So now the enemy is afraid. Just like the Philistines, the ark was on the ground and they said, God is on camp. The Israelites used God as a way, as a means to an end. They used God's presence as well, if he's here, then we're winning. If I just say Jesus, then it's calm. But there is power in the presence. There is power in the name. There is power in his word. There is power in the presence of God. God is too powerful to just be relegated to a, a symbol, a box. So he sees this happening all through the Old Testament. And this is why Jesus comes. So that we don't have a box. This morning, I was on my way here. And today I saw an unusual amount of Muslims than ever on a Sunday. And I was like, what's happening? What's happening? This Eid. So they've gone to go and worship around a box. Somewhere, where is it? Mecca. Those people are worshiping around a box. It stirred me as I sat on the bus and I saw people getting on, dressed in their best to go and worship a God whose bones we know where they are. But us, we worship the true living God but to even raise our hands in his presence to even know the power in his name just to be in his presence alone is more it's so much more but these people gather and they go to a symbol a box and they travel miles and miles and miles and miles is to go and do this pilgrimage around this box. God is too powerful to be relegated to a box. He's too powerful to be relegated to a building. He's too powerful to be relegated to just a secret room. He is in us, within us, upon us, speaking, breathing, working, talking in us. He is too powerful to remain in a box. So that's why Jesus comes. I'm just laying a foundation. Next week we'll continue a bit deeper. He's too powerful and he desires that we don't use him as an end to a mean means to an end rather. He desires that we don't use him just to get something. He desires that we don't just use him because we want a first class degree. He desires that I don't just use him because I want to be healed. He desires that I don't just use him because I know that if he's here then I have victory. He desires that I reverence him which is what we have done all day today. From the beginning We've worshipped, we've rendered praises, we've exalted Him. That is what we were created for. That's the one thing that God Almighty cannot do. He can't worship Himself. So He releases His presence and He says in this atmosphere, if only you would worship me, if only you would reverence me, if only you would see me as God, as the one true living God, He says, I will come and I will sit. I will dwell, I will make my home on your praises. So he releases his presence. He desires that he is our first call and not our last resort. He's not a trick up my sleeve. 
He's not a magic box. He's not a genie in a bottle. He is not just something that I use when life gets tough. He's not an antidote. He's not just a a figment of my imagination. He's not my last resort. He is my all in all, my everything. So he wants that we fear him, that we reverence him. We who serve a God who has never lost a a battle. We who serve a God who wins. We who serve a God who heals. Somehow we've lost the fear of the Lord. This isn't fear that you tremble. No, this is fear that you respect, you reverence him. Lord started to speak to me about some things and he said the church of God has no longer fears him we no longer fear God we've become complacent we've become laxed we've become relaxed we've become lazy minister Naomi was imploring us this morning to pray because people have become lazy We've become tired. We've grown. And I don't know what's making us tired. I get, you know, the spirit of the air. I I get that. Trust me, I know. But we who have the greatest God in us. We've become relaxed. We behave anyhow. We speak anyhow. We dress anyhow. We treat people anyhow. Worst of all, we treat God anyhow. The things of God are just there. Just there. We have a way of appearing like ones who are godly. We have a way of morphing into Christians. On a Sunday, we lift our hands. After being told, we jump a little, we raise our voices. We have a form. We fit in this mold of a Christian we deny the power thereof. Paul writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, apologies, chapter 3. And he warns Timothy of many things. Perilous times are coming. People be lovers of self, lovers of money, haters of God, disobedient to parents. Many, many things. So he warns Timothy about these things, right? Let's go there. First Timothy, Second Timothy 3, chapter 1, verse 1, sorry. But now, know this, that in the last days, perilous, perilous times will come. And that, that punctuation, just first go back a minute. What's that punctuation after come? It's a colon. That means that everything that is after is a list of the things that will come. Verse 2, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power. That word for form, it's morphous. They have a shape, a way. They appear godly. <laughs> and the, word for their, the word there for godliness is to respect, to revere God. They have a way that they appear that they respect God. A form of godliness. But they deny the power. They don't accept the power of God. They act completely different. They have a semblance to godliness. 
They resemble like people who know God. But then, it's completely different. The Bible says that there's nothing new under the sun. So what we see in scripture, a lot of times is happening now. It's happening now. We're living in these times where people have become complacent and we're not praying and we're not reading our word and we're just coming to church to hear a word that tickles us. And these days God is giving words that are not, they're not easy first of all to deliver, but they're not also not easy to take in. Sometimes I'm like, hey God, another one again when you give yourself to God and you just surrender you do what he says so as we continue we see we're back in 1 Samuel so these people have completely become relaxed with God they don't really reverence him as God they don't fear God anymore they just fear a box and God says okay I will show you so he allows that the Philistines take their symbol of the presence of the Lord and I wondered, like, why, why, would God, why would God have it that they would just, he would just relinquish the ark? And we'll come back to that in a second. In chapter 5, after the Philistines had won, despite God being on the ground, they took the ark. <laughs> they took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. And they took the Ark of the Covenant and they brought it into the house of Dagon. These guys really thought that they could put the presence of the Lord in the same space as an idol. And God said, okay, let me show you. Verse 3. When the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the Lord. Their God was half man, half fish. He was just there standing, minding his own business. And they brought the presence of the Lord into where he was and they expected nothing to happen so God says I will show you the power of the presence of the Lord that every idol has to bow it didn't just say that it fell it fell on its face before the Lord it bowed the power of the presence of God causes everything that is not God to bow that's the power that when we're in the presence of God, anything, everything that is not God must bow. It has no option. Sickness has to bow. Poverty has to bow. Diseases, death, they have to. They have no option. This was a man-made God. But when they placed it in the presence of the almighty God, when the ark was in the same vicinity, when the presence of the Lord came in contact with another idol, it bow. This is the power of the presence of the Lord. So when we gather, when we gather to pray, the Bible says in Matthew 18 verses 20, that where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. And he says, if two shall agree on a matter, it will settled in the heavens. So when we gather on a Sunday, we're not just coming into a building, we're entering into the presence of the Lord. Next week we'll understand that we carry the presence of the Lord. That we don't need to be in the four walls of the church to represent God or to see His power. That when I'm at home, I carry His presence. But today I want you to understand the power in His presence. So that was the first time. The second day, they came back. 
they came back. They took Dagon and they put him back up. And they arose early the next day. And there was Dagon, face to the ground, broken, palms broken, broken completely before the Lord. God cannot share his space with anyone. The almighty God cannot share his space with an idol. He cannot share his vicinity with an idol. He is a jealous God. Exodus 34, 13 to 14 says, but you shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves, for thou shalt not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. Let me tell you something about this word jealous. This word is only used for God. When you search through all of scripture, the word jealous is only used for God. It's his name. He doesn't share that with anybody else. It's beyond the feeling, oh, I'm jealous. No, he is jealous. His name is jealous. And the word jealous simply means it is used to say that he has no rival. Even the word itself is relegated to just him. He doesn't share his space with any idol. He is jealous. He says, I have no rival. Where I am, he says, no other God can stand. Where he is, no other thing can stand. If we claim to be the house of the Lord, but you still have something that is erected and it's an idol. I put it to you that you're not housing the one true living God. You're hosting something. It's not God. <laughs> no, 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 no. The presence of God can't be somewhere and chains remain. 2 Corinthians 3.17 Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Don't you know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? I'm wrapping up. So they put the presence of the Lord among a God, man-made God, and, said, and God says, No, 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 that's not how I operate. So after two days of seeing this thing happen, finally the Philistines are like, you know what? Take this thing. Get, let's take it away. Take it away, take it away, take it away, take it away. And when you read further on, the Philistines passed it to these people. They passed it to these people. They passed it to these people. They passed it to this one. Until eventually they were said, okay, we're tired. If you don't take this thing, the God of Israel will kill us. Take it away. We're tired. Please take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. And the Bible says that it remained seven months in the Philistines' camp, wreaking havoc. <laughs> Our God is so good. He lets everything happen. All of this is to show that He is mighty. All of this is to show that He is powerful because the Israelites had forgotten who their God is. They thought he was just in a box. They thought he was just a box. So they thought, no, it's fine. As long as the box is with us, we're okay. So God said, I need you to understand that I am the God of all flesh. So he allows the ark to be taken and it circles around all these territories. Seven months. For seven months, 1 Samuel 6, 1 says, and the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines, Philistines seven months. Do you know the number of seven means completion, perfection. I said, let me perfect my power while I'm at it. Let me show you that I, I don't play. Let me show you that nothing can come against me. Nothing can equal to me. Nothing can rival me. Nothing. So he allows them to experience the power of God. It's shown throughout all of the cities. There were about five cities. It was in Ashdod. Let me 
he said, no, take it away. The hand of the Lord was heavy upon them, dealt with them. They were struck with tumors. Go and read chapter 5. Then it went to Ekron. It went to Gath. It went to so many places until they were like, enough is enough. Let's return it to Israel. It's okay. We've learned our lesson. We've learned our lesson. And something stood out to me as I was reading chapter 6, 1 Samuel. I was reminded of the story that I shared earlier of Obed-Edom. And what's interesting is that in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we see the ark of the Lord doing something that's completely opposite. 1 Samuel 5, 6, the ark of the Lord is doing damage. It's just scattering Phoenician people left, right and center. And in chapter 6 of 2 Samuel, this same ark, this same presence, this same presence of God. When those that know who their God are, when they are in his presence, they are blessed. But when the presence of the Lord falls among people that don't know who he is, then there is havoc. That's where demons have to bow. In the presence of the Lord, there is liberty, but there's also demons bound. There's also things falling. So this presence of God is amazing. And the difference between 1 Samuel 6 or 5 and 6 and 2 Samuel 6 is that there's fear of the Lord. Obed Edom feared God. He knew who his God was. They respected God. They served no other God. They didn't have altars raised to any other idol. God is too sacred for us to be having other idols. And if we think that there won't be consequences for having idols, then we're playing ourselves. I said this last week, every altar speaks both evil and good. An altar is not an altar without a sacrifice. So we have an altar of all altars, the throne of God. And the sacrifice that sits on that altar is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Whose blood speaks a better thing than the blood of Abel. Every altar speaks. Once you sacrifice something on an altar, it speaks. It speaks. So in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we see a people who have no other altars raised. They have no other God standing. And where the ark of God was in Obed Edom's house for three months, they were blessed. In the presence of the Lord, Psalms 16, verse 11. In your presence are pleasures forevermore your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand pleasures forevermore so the power of the presence of God is that nothing can stand in his presence that's not him and then for those of us who do fear the Lord those of us that are redeemed we experience the fullness of joy we experience freedom liberty we experience his pleasures forevermore because we are part of a different covenant. We have been bought at a price and now we know that he has no rival. He can't share his space with anyone. So we've removed everything. We've taken away all of these things. Darkness has no business with light. Can't be both. You have to pick one. And the time has come us to pick whose side we're going to be on it's time for us to pick who we're going to serve it's time for us to pick who we're going to let rule 
rule and reign in our lives. But we can't serve two masters. We can't be people who can't be people who decide to serve a God and think a foreign God and think that there won't be consequences. Don't expect the results of the presence of God when you serve another. Don't expect fullness of joy, liberty, right? All these things, pleasures forevermore at his right hand if you're serving another God. Doesn't work. Doesn't, no, no, no. It's very, God is very black and white, jealous. He's, he says, I, I wish you would pick either hot or cold. Choose one. Free will is, he said, choose. I'm not going to force you. He says, choose. But don't expect the results and the experience of a God you do not serve, who you don't respect, who you don't fear. You can't deny the power of God and expect that same dynamis. The word there for power is dynamis, the manifested presence, manifested power, the shown power of God. The power that is seen. You can't worship another God and expect dynamis. You will, you will receive another type of power. He is too real for us to have a form of godliness. He is too real, too holy for us to think that we can come to God pretending. He's too smart for that. He sees right through it all. I'm reminded of a song that God, God gave me a while ago. the potter I am the clay I surrender my life into your hands I'm broken inside and though I hide it well you see right through the mask I wear there was a time when I would come to God in a mask there was a time where this form of godliness, I had it on lock. There was a time where my life wasn't making sense, but I knew that I could do, I could do church. I could have a form of godliness. I denied the power thereof. So I would wear a mask. Every Sunday. Sometimes even during the week. You know, some masks you just keep on at home. Oh, this one, even at home. I will hide. And I will keep myself. And when you come to God faking, you can't expect a real God to show his real face <laughs> when we're faking. He says, come to me. Come with all that you are. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me all who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. But he says, you have to come. Don't be heavy laden and afar. He says, come. He's made a way for us to come to, uh, to him. We remove the mask. We remove the form of godliness. And we just because in his presence is the power to break every yoke. In his presence is the power to heal every scar, every trauma, every pain of yesterday and even the one of tomorrow. In his presence he's the holder of my days. Treasure of my heart and of my soul. In, he says, in your weakness, his strength is perfected. In your weakness, that's when his strength is perfected. So we remove the mask. And we come to him. 
if you missed intercession, I'm honestly, I don't know why. Minister Naomi said something. He said, be vulnerable. Broken. Psalms 51. A broken and contrite heart, he can never despise. These are the sacrifices of God. He doesn't delight in burnt offerings anymore. We don't need those anymore. Not burnt offerings. He says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh Lord, you will not despise. So I come before him bearing everything. Knowing the power of his presence. Knowing that when I am in his presence, me who he died for. Me who he became a curse for. Me who he took on flesh. Step down from glory. War frail humanity. He came to seek and save me. I know that when I enter his presence as I am, naked, battered, bruised, hurt, he can never despise that. Father, we thank you for the power in your presence. We thank you for the power in your presence that you are here that where we are with you, you transform, you heal, you bring dead things to life, you restore. What I forgot to mention is that when the ark finally came back to the children of Israel and they repented, the Bible says that he restored all of the cities Everywhere that the ark went, he gave it back to the children of Israel. All the land that was stolen, where the Philistines, that was all Israel land. Ashdod, Gath, Ekron, all of that. Where the, he was perfecting something. For seven months he did a work, he transported the presence, his presence all over. So that when holiness and righteousness finally abounded, he said, then you can restore and have your possessions. Once they repented, he gave them back all of those cities that were once stolen. The presence of the Lord. of joy there is restoration 